numbers, date, country and town of birth and so on, there was a sudden commotion outside. At first we paid it no mind, wrestling as we were to remember our mother's maiden names and trying to work out who to elect as next of kin. But the racket outside increased and we suddenly realised that it was the sound of distressed chickens. Our chickens. We rushed outside. The stuffed dragon was attacking our chickens. It had one of them in its mouth and was shaking it. But as soon as it saw us and others closing in on him, it scurried rapidly round the corner of the building and off across the clearing behind in a cloud of dust, dragging the other distraught chickens tumbling along in the dust behind it, still tethered together with the string and screeching. After the dragon had put about thirty yards between it and us, it paused and with a vicious jerk of its head bit through the string, releasing the other chickens, which scrambled off towards the trees, shrieking and screaming and running in ever-decreasing circles as park guards careered after them, trying to round them up. The dragon, relieved of its excess chickens, galloped off into the thick undergrowth. With a lot of, after you, no, after you, we ran carefully towards where it had disappeared and arrived breathless and a little nervous. We peered in. The undergrowth covered a large bank, and the dragon had crawled up the bank and stopped. The thick vegetation prevented us getting closer than a yard to the thing, but we weren't trying terribly hard. It lay there quite still. Protruding from between its jaws was the back end of the chicken, its scrawny legs quietly working the air. The dragon lizard watched us unconcernedly with the one eye that was turned towards us, a round, dark brown eye. There is something profoundly disturbing about watching an eye that is watching you, particularly when the eye that is watching you is almost the same size as your eye and the thing it is watching you out of is a lizard. The lizard's blink was also disturbing. It wasn't the normal rapid reflex movement that you expect from a lizard, but a slow, considered blink, which made you feel that it was thinking about what it was doing. The back end of the chicken struggled feebly for a moment, and the dragon chomped its jaws a little to let the chicken's struggles push it further down its throat. This happened a couple more times, until there was only one scrawny chicken foot still sticking ridiculously out of the creature's mouth. Otherwise, it did not move. It simply watched us. In the end, it was us that slunk away, trembling with an inexplicable cold horror. Why? we wondered as we sat in the terrace cafeteria and tried to calm ourselves with Seven Up. The three of us were sitting ashen faced, as if we had just witnessed a foul and malignant murder. At least if we had been watching a murder, the murderer wouldn't have been looking us impassively in the eye as he did it. Maybe it was the feeling of cold, unflinching arrogance that so disturbed us. But whatever malign emotions we tried to pin onto the lizard, we knew that they weren't the lizard's emotions at all, only ours. The lizard was simply going about its lizardly business in a simple, straightforward, lizardly way. It didn't know anything about the horror, the guilt, the shame, the ugliness that we, uniquely guilty and ashamed animals, were trying to foist on it. So we got it all straight back at us, as if reflected in the mirror of its single, unwavering and disinterested eye. Subdued with the thought that we had somehow been horrified by our own reflection, we sat quietly and waited for lunch. Lunch. In view of all the events of the day so far, lunch suddenly seemed to be a very complicated thing to contemplate. Lunch, as it turned out, was not a chicken. It wasn't a chicken because the dragon had eaten it. How the kitchen was able to determine that the chicken the dragon had eaten was the precise one that they were otherwise going to do for lunch was not clear to us, but apparently that was the reason we were having plain noodles, and we were grateful for it. We talked about how easy it was to make the mistake of anthropomorphizing animals and projecting our own feelings and perceptions onto them, where they were inappropriate and didn't fit. We simply had no idea what it was like being an extremely large lizard. And neither, for that matter, did the lizard, because it was not self-conscious about being an extremely large lizard. It just got on with the business of being one. To react with revulsion to its behaviour was to make the mistake of applying criteria that are only appropriate to the business of being human. 
We each make our own accommodation with the world and learn to survive in it in different ways. What works as successful behaviour for us does not work for lizards, and vice versa. For instance, said Mark, we don't eat our own babies if they happen to be within reach when we're feeling a little peckish. What? said Gaynor, putting down her knife and fork. A baby dragon is just food as far as an adult is concerned, Mark continued. It moves about and has got a bit of meat on it. It's food. If they ate them all, of course, the species would die out, so that wouldn't work very well. Most animals survive because the adults have acquired an instinct not to eat their babies. The dragons survive because the baby dragons have acquired an instinct to climb trees. The adults are too big to do it, so the babies just sit up in trees till they're big enough to look after themselves. Some babies get caught, though, which works fine. It sees them through times when food is scarce and helps to keep the population within sustainable levels. Sometimes they just eat them anyway. How many of these things are there left? I asked quietly. Oh, about 5,000, said Mark. And how many did there used to be? About 5,000, he said. And as far as anyone can tell, that's roughly how many there have always been. So they're not particularly endangered. Well, they are, Mark said, because only 350 of them are breeding females. We don't know if that's a typical number or not, but it seems pretty low. Furthermore, if an animal has a low population and lives in a very restricted area, like just a few small islands in the case of the dragons, it's particularly vulnerable to changes in its habitat, and wherever human beings arrive, habitats start changing pretty quickly. So we shouldn't be here, I said. It's arguable, said Mark. If no one was here taking an interest, the chances are very strong that something could go wrong. Just one forest fire or a disease in the deer population could wipe out the dragons. And there's also the worry that the growing human population on the islands could start to feel that they could very well live without them. They're very dangerous animals. There's not merely the danger of being eaten by one. If you just get bitten, you're in very serious trouble. You see, when a dragon attacks a horse or a buffalo, it doesn't necessarily expect to kill it there and then. If it gets involved in a fight, it might get injured, and there's no benefit in that. So sometimes the dragon will just bite it and walk away. But the bacteria that live in a dragon's saliva are so virulent that the wounds will not heal, and the animal will usually die in a few days of septicemia, whereupon the dragon can eat it at leisure. Or another dragon can eat it if it happens to find it first. They're not really fussed. It's good for the species that there's a regular supply of badly injured and dying animals about the place. There was a well-known case of a Frenchman who was bitten by a dragon and eventually died in Paris two years later. The wound festered and just would never heal. Unfortunately, there were no dragons in Paris to take advantage of it, so the strategy broke down on that occasion, but generally it works well. The point is that these things are buggers to have living on your doorstep. And though the villagers on Komodo and Rincher have been pretty tolerant, there has been a history of attacks and deaths, and it's possible that as the human population grows, there will be a greater conflict of interest, and rather less patience with the idea of not being able to go off for a wander without running the risk of having your leg bitten off and your entrails ripped out by a passing dragon. So, as we've discovered, Komodo is now a protected national park. We've got to the point where it takes active and deliberate intervention to save rare species, and that's usually sustained by public interest and public interest is sustained by public access. If it's carefully controlled and disruption is kept to a minimum, then it works well and is fine, uh, I think. I won't pretend that I don't feel uneasy about it.